Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's service of worship uh, as we gather on this another Lord's Day to uh, focus our minds on our wonderful uh, God, our great Redeemer, and to sing his praise and continue our studies in the Ten Commandments to see what we have to learn today from God's Word. Hope you gentlemen are not too distracted with the roast in the oven and uh, in, in taking over the kitchen today on this Mother's Day uh, and uh, you're able to focus on, on service. I am proud to say, not all pride comes before a fall, but I am proud to say I was up, the spuds are peeled, the cauliflower's in the pot and the roast is ready to go in the oven and uh, Tracy will have it in the oven before I get home. Um, hopefully that's all she has to do today, but I trust you her have a blessed day on this Mother's Day. A few announcements uh, for the week that lies ahead. Uh, prayer meeting on Wednesday at 8 on Zoom. It'd be great to see more of you there. I appeal to you. I know it's not the same as gathering together, but we do have some wonderful times on a Wednesday night as we gather around the throne of grace and we bring much before the Lord and rejoice we have seen God answer some prayers in the most marvellous ways, and we rejoice in his presence. Prayer meeting at 8 on Zoom, details on Facebook, or give me a ring at the manse, and I'll pass on those login details to you. Next Sunday, of course, we're back as usual. Children's Church will go out at 10.30 on Facebook, uh, and then the service will go out as usual at 11 a.m. through uh, Facebook and YouTube and our website as well. And then one uh, announcement, which is a bit of advance notice. Two weeks' time on Saturday the 27th of this month, uh, once again, members of uh, the count team and the committee will be in the car park from 11 a.m. to 12 noon if any of you wish to bring down your free will offering or other gifts towards the ministry of the church. So that's two weeks' time. I'll remind you of that next week on Saturday the 27th. But we come to worship. We come to praise our great God in this opening Hymn is, 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 is a wonderful hymn. It's one we know well. It's a great hymn of, of assurance and of comfort because before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect belief, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart, I know that while in heaven he Stands. No tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me all. on her. 
Let's bow and pray before this strong and perfect plea who sits enthroned above. Let's pray. We bow before you, the Almighty God, and also our loving Heavenly Father, the one who is seated in heaven, the one who is high and lifted up, the one who is above all powers, beyond the highest thought of any of our minds. You are the holy, holy, holy God. And beside you there is no other, for you are God and God alone. All other gods, whatever shape and form they take, Lord, are simply a a figment of our imagination, created by our hands and are lifeless and are powerless and are useless. We bow before you, the one who sits in heaven as the almighty and as the eternal God of all creation. Father, you're the one who causes the wind to blow and has been howling around us in recent days. You're the one who causes the rain to fall on us and to water the ground. You're the one who causes the sun to rise and bring warmth and produce growth. You are the one who is in sovereign control of all those things. And yet you are also gracious and loving For you incline your ear to hear the cries of the brokenhearted, of those who mourn their sin against you, their creator. Father, you love us so deeply that you you gave us a savior. And we thank you for him. The one who came, was born, lived, who died upon the cross, rose from the grave, and is now ascended and seated at your right hand, interceding for worthless souls such as us, pleading for us before your throne of grace and mercy. And Lord, we thank you for him. And we thank you that through him, because of of all that he has done, because he is perfect in, in every single way, we can find forgiveness. We can be reconciled unto you. We can be your children instead of your enemies. We can be rescued from your judgment and wrath because you look upon him and pardon us. We praise you, Lord, that not only do you give life to the dead, but you sustain that life forevermore. You give us life eternal. We thank you that because of that perfect, spotless, risen lamb, we are secure in your hands for all of eternity. Oh, Lord, each and every day, but today as we gather in our homes, around our screens to worship you, would you be gracious and open our eyes, see the depths of the love that you have poured out upon us. Would you help us to see the vastness of your grace that we are wholly dependent upon? If only we could get a glimpse of how good you are. Then, Lord, we would would be transformed. 
we would live in the joy of your salvation and we would not fail to to join our voices with all who are gathered around your throne and we wouldn't we would cry out and praise worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing oh sovereign god loving father would you come and move among us by your spirit would you come and and transform us to be more like your precious son would you be kind and gracious and receive our imperfect praise that we bring to you in christ's name amen amen well morning boys and girls hope you're keeping well I know some of you are back to school, uh, some of the younger ones. I hope you're, you're enjoying that and delighted to see your friends again and hopefully delighted to see your teachers as well. Um, but I hope you're, you're doing all right. I have a few pictures to show you. Uh, hopefully they're coming up on your screen now to see. I wonder, do you, do, do you know what these are? Do you recognize these or, or, or do you know what they are? Yep, they're all, they're all sort of statues, aren't they? They're all statues or, or, or monuments or memorials. Maybe some of you may recognize the big one is Queen Victoria. She's uh, outside the City Hall in Belfast, the one in the top middle. Um, well, you know me, I love the Chronicles of Narnia. That's uh, a, a statue representing Aslan, uh, the great character from those books. The bottom two you might recognize, one's just up the pathway behind me here in the church grounds, and the other one is the memorial down in the middle of the village. Maybe the one in the top right has baffled some of you, and I'd say it would baffle the parents as well, um, because apparently, I'm gonna be very critical of a person who couldn't, can't write, never mind draw and create, but apparently that's gonna be a picture of George Best, uh, or a statue of him. But anyway, we'll not get into that. The statues, this sort of thing's grand, isn't it? They decorate the place, they they brighten up uh, various towns and cities and different places. Statues and memorials are are, are a good thing, guys. They're good because they help remind us about people or events that happened in the past who had a a very positive influence generally or had a significant influence on our lives. War memorials to remind us of the great sacrifice of the past or... Uh, Queen Victoria, a great ruler, a great queen of the past, George Best, best footballer ever to come out of this country, and how he, he influenced people's lives and brought much joy to them. They're good things to have, very good things to have. Um, but, but we can we can view them in a wrong way as well because statues and memorials can become more than they're supposed to be. They can become more than reminders. They can become what we call idols, something that people turn to to worship. I want to tell you a well-known story from the Bible this morning, one that you will know and should be able to tell me, uh, never mind me, me tell you, but I want to tell you a story about people who, who made an idol, who made a statue and began to worship it. You know we've been doing the Ten Commandments and we're getting very close to the end of them. But... You go back to the Bible, I'm sure you remember this. It was Moses who was given the Ten Commandments by God, and Moses had to climb a mountain called Mount Sinai uh, to spend time in God's presence alone to receive these commandments. And, and he was up there for a very, very long time, much longer than the people of Israel thought he should be away uh, as the leader, as their leader. And they were getting very frustrated and getting very fed up. So they went to Aaron, and they said to him, Listen, Aaron, we want you to create gods for us. We want you to create a God who, who will go before us so that we know where, where we should be going. And because Moses has gone away for a long time, we, we, we don't know where he's gone. He brought us out of Egypt. Now he's disappeared. We want a God that will lead us on our journey. Aaron was a bit of a softy. He was a bit of a, a fool at this time because he said to him, okay, well, give me all your gold earrings and jewelry. Bring them to me and I'll do something with them. Uh, and so the people did that. They gave him their, their gold earrings and, uh, and he melted it all down uh, and he made this. He made a golden calf. And the people were just ecstatic about this. They thought this was beautiful. This was wonderful. This, this was something they could look up to. And they, they, they danced around it and they sang songs and basically they worshipped it. They worshipped it. What fools absolute idiots to put it bluntly why well what could this calf do for them nothing it was dead it was just an object could could it actually be their leader because they wanted someone to lead them through the desert could it lead them no 
because it was just a, a solid piece of gold. There was no life in it. Could it save them from their enemies, those who would attack them on their journey? Could it defend them and defeat them, the enemies? No. It was powerless. It was just a lump of gold. And not only was it ridiculous that they put their trust in, in this object to lead them and to protect them and provide for them, but actually, to use that bi- word from the Bible, it was sinful. It was sinful for them to worship a calf, to worship this object that had been made by a man's hands. All this was going on down below. Moses was still up on the mountain with God, but God is a God who knows everything, and God knew what was going on down at the foot of Mount Sinai. And he turned to Moses and he said, Moses, look, the people have forgotten about me. The people have rejected me. Uh, and uh, and have made this, this idol, and I am angry with them that they have done this and turned their back on me. They have been unfaithful to me, and I will destroy them. Moses had a good heart, uh, uh, and he, he didn't want this to happen. He, he loved the people, uh, and he wanted the best for the people, so he begged God. He said, no, Lord, don't, please don't. Give them another chance. Please don't. You, you've made a promise to, to Abraham and Isaac, a promise to build a great nation, to bring us to a promised land. Keep your promise, please. And God listened to Moses, and he didn't destroy the people because they had been unfaithful to him. Mind you, Moses came down from the mountain, and he was furious when he actually saw what was going on. He was so angry that he threw the two stones that had written, he had written the Ten Commandments on to the ground and smashed them into many pieces. He couldn't believe that the people had been so quick to forget God who had brought them out of Egypt and across uh, the river and protected them and, and provided for them, that, that, that they'd forgotten about this great and kind and generous God. And, uh, and then he turned his golden calf and he, and he shattered it. He broke it into pieces. He ground it down into powder. And wait do you hear what he did next, guys? He poured the powder in the water and made the people drink it. Made the people drink it. Ugh, imagine that. They had forgotten God and made their own gods. Now, you would have thought people would have been clever and, and learnt from that and, and remembered that and told their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren about the mistake they made, but they didn't. They didn't, guys. They have short memories. hope you were tuned in to Children's Church this morning. And Sandra was telling you a story about a guy called Gideon who lived many years after Moses. And how even then the people had forgotten what had happened here and had turned to worshipping idols, had forgotten their God. They didn't learn any lessons. Uh, and, and, and the enemies were closing in on them to defeat them and destroy them. And you know the sad thing is, the history repeats itself as we say and goes, guys. People keep forgetting. Go and read the Bible and you see time after time after time after time the people forgot who the real God was and what he had done for them and they turned to worshipping false gods. They never learnt. And we haven't learnt today either. Too often as we put things before God, we, we put things above God and we forget about him. We may not make a golden calf like this, but maybe it's things like money. Money is more important to us than God. Maybe our friends are more important to us than God. Maybe some of you are into sport and you have your sport idols or, or maybe playing sport is more important than God. Maybe your studies or your favorite toys or these things here have become a real God. We put stuff before God. In other words, if we put anything before loving God, then that's an idol. We're, we're doing no different to what these people did in our story from long ago. And God says when we put something before him, we break the second commandment, as our picture says. We worship idols, and God says, don't worship idols. Don't put things before me. Don't think money or toys or friends or whatever is more important than me. He says, what I want you to be is loyal to me. I want you to be loyal, be faithful to me and worship me and worship me alone because I am the only true God. Every other God is just something that you've thought about in your head and you've made with your hands. 
Guys, the golden calf couldn't help the people of Israel. And all the things we put before God can't help us because the God of the Bible is the all-powerful God who made everything and holds everything in his hands. And this God wants you and me to have a relationship with him. He wants us to follow him, to trust in him, to obey him, and to worship him alone. I want you to take time today to think about this. What is the most important thing in your life? The Bible says, this commandment says, it should be God. The God that we read about in this book. The God who has made each and every one of us. Let's pray together before we sing a song. Lord Jesus, we are sorry for the way we've allowed things to become too important to us. We are sorry for the idols that we have made and, and we hold on to. We're sorry for when we have not been loyal to you, faithful to you. We're sorry for how we have denied you. Please forgive us and give us the strength and the power to be loyal to you first and foremost each and every day. Amen. Idols of no power, guys. The calf or whatever we, 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 we think is the most important thing in life has no power, but the God of the Bible is all powerful. Our God is an awesome God. have an awesome God. There is no one like him. Uh, he is uh, above all other gods. So uh, folks, consider, uh, we will be considering in our sermon uh, who we worship, what we worship, and what do we put our trust in. Please look up uh, Jeremiah chapter 10. Ch Jeremiah chapter 10. We're going to read from that. But as you're flicking that up, I just want to remind you of the second commandment as we find it in Exodus. It says here, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath 
or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. That is the second commandment, and we're going to read uh, from Jeremiah which is uh, chapter 10, which is a great passage which, which speaks about idols and the one true living God. Uh, let's hear God's word to us this morning. Hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them, for the customs of the peoples are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field, and they cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither is it in them to do good. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. They are both stupid and foolish. The instruction of idols is but wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. They are the work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple. They are all the work of skilled men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Thus shall you say to them, the gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens and he makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He makes the lightning for the rain and he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols for his images are false and there is no breath in them. They are worthless, a work of delusion at the time of their punishment, they shall perish. Not like these is he who is the portion of Jacob. For he is the one who formed all things. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Amen. We thank God for his wonderful and precious word to us this morning. What does idolatry mean to you, folks? If we were to sit and have a conversation about idols what would pictures will come into your head? And do you think this, this commandment of do not worship idols applies to, to us, to you and me? Well, the truth is, it does. Because every single one of us is guilty of the sin of idolatry. And for us to grasp why we break this commandment, we, we, we need to know what the Bible means by idolatry. What is its definition? When the English Standard Version, which I read from, the word idol is translated as a carved image. And actually, it's, uh, that's probably a more accurate um, interpretation of the original Hebrew. It's about a, an object that has been crafted by a tool in the hands of a craftsman. Now, let me explain this. Maybe I'm rambling a bit and you'll be confused, but hopefully not. There is nothing wrong in making things to decorate our homes or even our places of worship. God has blessed people with creative and artistic ability, abilities to do such things. In Exodus 31, when he was given, God was given instructions for building the tabernacle, he sent the Spirit upon the Israelites, and we read this in verses 4 and 5. 
He sent the spirit to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. So it's not, there's nothing wrong in, in making places decorative and, and, and attractive looking. But when they become the focus of our worship, then that's when the problem arises. And this is made clear in, in, in the passage I read from Exodus where this commandment is given. Listen to what God said. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. It's when they become the focus of our worship that we violate this commandment. And I don't know what picture pops into your head when we talk about idols, but they take various forms. Maybe, maybe we think of those cultures and those religions that, that, that do have little idols, like Bud Buddhism and Hinduism that sit on, on people's homes or in, in temples of worship. But the reality is, folks, that idolatry in the vast majority of the world and in most societies is much more subtle and seductive. Let me read a, a quote. This is, a, a, I think, a very powerful quote that shows how the ancient pagan gods are still very much alive today in, in, in your life and in my life, albeit in different appearances. Listen to what this writer had to say. The temple of Ra, the sun god, has now been replaced with warm weather resorts and tanning salons where worshippers pay, pay homage to their bronzing god. The temples of Ptah, the god of craftsmen, are today hardware, hardware st stores and tools. The temples of Nemea, Olympia, Delphi, and Isthmia, including stadiums, which included stadiums which have now been replaced with sports grounds, where pagan fans dress up like they always have as birds and animals to cheer, on, cheer for their gods as they score goals or score points. The oracular gods often had sanctuaries near fresh water sources that we refer to as beaches, campsites, golf courses, or fishing grounds. The small shrines that filled ancient homes and required homage and financial sacrifice have long since been upgraded with home entertainment systems and high-speed internet connections. And finally, Paul once wrote that our God is our stomach and that God is worshipped by the gluttonous and obese at all you can eat buffets. You get the comparison. They may look differently, but we all have idols in our lives. And idolatry occurs when we hold any value, any idea, any activity, any person higher than the one true God. And, you know, it is tempting to think of idolatry in the manner we've just discussed, whether it be those false religions or, or whether it be some of those practices that I've just quoted in that story from another writer. It's to do with material possessions and, uh, and lifestyles. But what about us within the church? What about us within the Christian church? Do we have idols? Many people say, no, we don't. We don't have idols. Well, some branches do, and we may point the finger at the Roman Catholic Church or, or the Orthodox branches of the church with, with their little statues and icons to say they're breaking this commandment. But we're in the, we're in the Reformed Church. We're in the Protestant Church. We, we don't do things like that there. Or do we? I once read a, 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 an article by a Christian journalist who was, who was writing a story on how in his... Uh, his denomination, as he was going through a course in theology, he really struggled with it because what was being taught was far from biblical truth, and, and, he, and he had to object to what his lecturers were saying. And he says the church authorities responded by saying that truth is subjective and that he had no need to believe what he did not agree with in his classes. And yet he said when it came to actually leading a service of worship in the cathedral. Those authorities who told him that, that truth was subjective and he didn't have to believe what, what others said, 
he was told that to, in order to, to lead a service of worship, to officiate, he had to wear certain garments or else he couldn't lead the worship. Certain garments were essential to leading people in the worship of God. And he had no choice but to wear them. Friends, as I've said on previous occasions, uh, and we all need reminding of it, I need reminding of it, we can become more concerned about our property, our practices, and our programs than we can about walking in obedience to God's word. And the worshipping of God in spirit and truth. A couple of weeks ago, I, 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 I said, a, a, I quoted from a, another author about the fourth commandment, and he said this, the stand Christians take on many issues often reveals their commitment to tradition or their capitulation to co contemporary culture rather than a clear head of conviction concerning the teaching of God's word. And that applies to our property our practices, and our programs as well. Now, some of you will say, Ronnie, you're way off the mark there. We're not like that at all. We're not like that at all. Well, let me ask you this. How many of you would be happy if I came in and changed our traditions, our ways of going things? How many of you would be happy if when we started to reopen, we said, well, we're not running that organization again, or we're not doing things in that way? Or we're going we're gonna to rip, change this place about. We're going to change the structure of this building. I would have to say, I think there would be more a passion aroused when we try to introduce change into church life rather than, than, than a, a, an excitement and a desire and a hunger and a thirst to submit to God's word or, or, or a commitment to fulfilling the commission that God has given his church to, to go and make disciples of every nation. Sadly, in too many of our, our, our congregations, the greatest passion is to do with changing tradition than it is to walking in God's ways. See, friends, in the church, tradition becomes idolatry when it is elevated above the word of God. And therefore, we do break the second commandment. We read from Jeremiah earlier. Read, read that passage again. It's very, very challenging. But Jeremiah said, this, the customs of the people are vanity. Or another word for vanity is idols. The customs of the church can be vanity. They can be our idols. And so I simply throw this question out for us all to think about, including myself. What... Or whom do we worship in first Christian? Well, why is idolatry wrong? Why, why has God given us this commandment? Why does he need to tell us this? Well, he gives a reason in verse 5 of Exodus 20. He says, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And when we talk about jealousy, uh, we normally think of, of envy, uh, of having a desire to get something that doesn't belong to us, being jealous of somebody in their new car or their, uh, their, 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 their newest house or, or whatever the case is. And, and, and usually that means we're breaking the 10th commandment, which is do not covet. But this is not what is meant when, when we refer to God being jealous when the Bible speaks of God being jealous, it is speaking of his, his zeal, his fervor, his passion for that which is rightfully his. When the Bible speaks of God's jealousy, it is, it is speaking of his love, his, his commitment to his chosen people, his desire to protect and provide for them. You know, Time and time again in, in the scriptures, the relationship between God and his chosen people is, is, is spoken of in terms of, of the marital relationship. And, and J. John, in his book on the Ten Commandments, illustrates that relationship and the idea of God being jealous in the following manner. Imagine if your wife discovered a picture of another woman in your wallet. Do you think she would shrug her shoulders and say, well, that's interesting, but sure, he's a right to his privacy. Or do you think it is more likely she will say, who is this? How do you think she would feel if she discovered that you turned to this other woman when you felt the need of support and affection? 
do you think it will bother her? Do you think she would believe you when you say, I love you with all my heart? Could you fault her for feeling jealous, hurt, and angry? She is your wife. She has every right to expect and even insist that you keep yourself for her alone. The second commandment is a love issue. Your spouse doesn't want any rivals for your love, and God doesn't either. An idol is a substitute for the real thing, and God's response to our our idolatry is jealousy. In the Old Testament, idolatry is called adultery to God because idolatry is unfaithfulness. So friends, we put anything before God. We are committing spiritual adultery. And God has every right to be jealous and angry with us. And that's why this commandment comes with a, both a warning but also a promise. And, and the warning is this, that God will punish, as we read, read in, in Exodus, punish children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And friends, when we make idols, when we put something before the one true God, we are saying we hate him. And therefore, it should be no surprise if God issues this warning to punish those who hate him. And some people have a, a, a difficulty with this, this promise because it talks about punishing the children of the, of, of the fathers for the father's sin. And, and there's that automatic thing within us to say, well, the father sinned, he's guilty, but the children are innocent. And, and why should they be punished by God? Because of what the father did. But listen to the words of God. He will punish to the third or fourth generation of those who hate me. See, friends, it's not just the fathers who hated God, but the children who came to hate God. Because the way the fathers live, the way we live today, will set the standard for the children of the future. The example we set today will be the one that our children will follow into the future. And the warning tells us that our idolatry Whatever we worship, whatever we have put above God, will be indelibly marked on our children. And therefore, they will be subject to God's punishment just as we are. But, but there's always hope and there's always a positive message in the word of God. And God has given a promise He's given a promise which lasts, as the NIV says, for a thousand generations. In other words, it will last forever. To whom? To those who love me and keep my commandments. This was the promise going all the way back to Abraham when God said in Genesis 17, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And if we go back to the story of Abraham, we see how God stepped into Abraham's life and his life of his family. He called them, he rescued them from a life of idolatry to following after the one true God, to loving the one true God, to worshiping the one true God, to trusting in the one true God, to following where he would lead Abraham and his family. And we know that Abraham experienced the blessing of God. His family and his descendants experienced the eternal blessing of God when they loved God and kept his commandments. Friends, if we want to experience this promise of God, this promise of everlasting blessing, then it's very simple what we have to do. We have to respond to the call of God who loves us, to abandon our idols and to love him faithfully in return i don't know if you've met, visited many royal palaces or or any his, sort of royal museums and stuff like that but maybe in some of those trips if you've you've gone there you've seen uh, the throne room you've seen the throne where the king or the queen uh, sits and, and 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 makes decisions from and and so on and and throughout history and, and th- in different countries and different royal families those thrones look different they come in different shapes and sizes they're decorated in different ways but there's one thing that every throne in every country in every period in history has in common 
They were built for one person. You don't get a, a, a throne pew where many people sit on. You don't get a, a throne couch where many people can lounge on. A throne is built for one person and one person alone. And friends, there should only be room for one God in our lives, one God to be our king, one God to reign over us. Uh, so I simply ask you this question as we come to a close. What is your God? What shape is your God? What or whom takes the highest priority in your life? Take time to think about that. To assess your life. What takes the highest priority? If it's not God of the Bible, if it's not Yahweh, the creator of all things, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal and holy God, then you need and I need to come before God and confess my sin of idolatry and I need to dethrone the idols from my life. And we need to let Jesus reign supreme. He needs to be our king. He needs to be our only God. He needs to be the focus of all of our worship. Let's pray. And as we come to pray, just take a moment at this stage to come before God and to ask him to show each and every one of us what idols we have in our lives, what we have placed before him, what takes too much of our time, too much of our attention. Let's use those great words of Psalm 139 to help us in this prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Sovereign God, forgive us. For we have all removed you from your rightful place in our lives. We have given our hearts to other things. Things that have been created by our imaginations. Things that have been created by our hands. Rather than bowing before you, the sovereign God of all creation. The one who has made everything. The one who sustains everything. The one who reigns over everything. Lord, today and in the days that lie ahead, give us the strength, give us that desire to worship you and you alone as the one true God. And Almighty God, we come before your throne of grace, asking that you would be gracious and hear our cries and, and cr come and, and work in mighty ways amongst your people and, and for your glory. Father, we, we pray for f that tomorrow you would move in a mighty way in Stormont, as the second reading of that severe fetal impairment abortion amendment bill goes ahead. Father, we pray for those who will speak in favor of this bill and the precious nature of, of all life. The Father, that you will give them clarity of thought and of word. You will give them uh, gracious words and kind words and compassionate words in this very emotive subject. Father, we pray for a very positive outcome in this proposal. We pray that the majority of MLAs will vote in favor of it and help protect the lives of the unborn. Father, you're Lord of the church, not just here in Brisbane, but right across the world. And, and we pray for your church in Scotland uh, in, in this incoming week as it awaits the outcome of a, of a judicial review on the legality of the decisions by the Scottish government to force churches to close during this pandemic. Father, we, we know that the outcome of this decision could have serious implications for, for, to the church right across the UK. So we pray for a right outcome. And that the governments will under, recognize that churches are ultimately answerable to you. But may we recognize we also have a responsibility to act, to act in a way that respects earthly authority, which has been appointed by you. And also to make wise decisions to protect our members and the wider community from, from harm. So again, we pray for our, our brothers and sisters in Scotland. And we ask, Lord, that you would encourage them and, and, and work through them and in them during this process. And Father, we pray for ourselves. We continue to pray for those amongst us who are unwell, for your healing hand and your comfort to be upon them. 
We pray for strength for those who, who are weak, Lord, whether it be as a result of uh, physical frailty or whether it's an emotional and a, and, a, and a mental weakness, we pray for strength for them. We pray for those who mourn that they would find their comfort in you. We pray for those who have troubled hearts for whatever reason, Lord, that they would know your peace that passes all understanding. And Father, we pray that we will once again be able to meet together very, very soon here for worship as we praise your name together in one place or even just simply in each other's company. So, Lord, we can bring encouragement, and we can offer support, and we can help each other in the days that lie ahead. I pray that you would help us to be patient and wise as this virus continues to cause harm to far, far too many in not, not only our community, but right across the world. To trust that this is no surprise for you, and you have an ultimate purpose for it. And help us to lean upon you and to listen to you and to walk in a way that brings you glory. So, Father, hear our prayers and empower us to shine brightly for you in the days that lie ahead wherever you will lead us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us again this week. And as you know, we're always on the end of a phone. If you ever need to talk about anything or if God's been speaking to you, uh, Hazel and myself are here or, or the elders as well. If you need someone to speak to and to pray with, even if it's over the phone, please, please do give us a call. In this closing hymn, it's a wonderful, wonderful old hymn by William Cowper. Beautiful hymn. It was lovely to sit and listen to, to Richard and Amy practicing it earlier. But one of the verses says this, The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear from thy throne and worship only thee. Oh, for a closer walk with God. Thank you.
now to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.